Part Two. Growing up, Cha Chuang c h o d Luang Po Cha was born on the seventh waning day of the seventh moon of the year of the horse, 1918. He was the fifth of eleven children born to Ma and Pim Chuang c h o d who, like the vast majority of their generation, were subsistence rice farmers. The name Cha means clever, capable, resourceful. In accordance with custom, Luang Po's mother gave birth to him kneeling, her arms above her head, grasping a rope suspended from the rafters of the house. Afterwards, she endured fifteen days of confinement, lying with her stomach as close as possible to a charcoal brazier to dry out her womb, an ancient custom that still survived in the countryside, despite some seventy years previously. King m o n g k u t railing against it as this senseless and monstrous crime of having women smoked and roasted. In his first few months after weaning, Luang Po's mother would have fed him by chewing and masticating sticky rice in her own mouth, and then gently spooning it into his. Luang Po was born into an affectionate and respected household, one of the wealthier families in a closely knit community. The Isan villagers of those days, isolated by forests and vulnerable to the vagaries of the weather and the caprice of spirits, put great store on sharing, generosity, and harmony. The model was of extended families living together or in adjoining houses, and over generations, almost everybody in a village would be related at one remove or another with everybody else. Houses were made of wood, roofed with grass thatch, and raised on stilts as protection from floods and wild animals. They were placed close together, with no fixed boundaries between them. Life was conducted on a large, open space upstairs, with rooms used only for sleeping. People not only heard their neighbors' family dramas; they could see them as well. There was no concept of privacy. Much less a desire for it. The villagers subscribed to respect for monks, elders, and spirits. They valued consideration for the feelings of others, and a healthy sense of right and wrong. And they relished laughter and conversation. Luang Po grew up with a strong sense of community and place, and the gift of the gab. The adjective that was often used to describe Luang Po in his later years. Ebullient is the one that comes most readily to mind when picturing him as a child. He had an outgoing, sunny, and occasionally exuberant disposition, but also possessed a keen, observant eye. He was nobody's fool. Luang Po bore the round face and flat lion's nose common to his race. More distinctively, his mouth was unusually wide and compelling. In contrast to the powerful symmetry of his face, his right ear was slightly larger than the left. He was acknowledged as the natural leader of his group of friends. Companions remembered him as the one whom everyone wanted to be close to, and without whom all games and adventures seemed dull. They recalled his even temper. They said he never enforced his dominance with bullying or coercion, and that no one could recall him in a fight. He was more likely to be a mediator in his companions' disputes, and from an early age, he was drawn by the yellow robe. In later years, he related childhood memories of dressing up as a monk. He said he would sit sternly on an old bamboo bed, with his kamar cloth, the all-purpose piece of cloth used by Thai males. Draped over his left shoulder like a robe, while his friends played the parts of the laity, he remembered enacting the daily meal offering, presumably the only event in the monk's daily life that lent itself to drama. Luang Po would ring a bell, and his friends would carry plates of fruit and cool water towards him. After bowing three times, they would offer it to him meekly. In return, he would give them the five precepts. And a blessing. 
Isan culture lacks a hard and fast distinction between the ideas of work and play. The word ngan expresses this fluidity well, meaning both work and also festival, ceremony or fair. Children brought up in the villages of Isan have always been taught to take on responsibilities from an early age, in the fields, in the house and in raising younger siblings. For the most part, they seem to possess a natural talent for enjoying their duties. In Lung Po's day, children's main job would be taking the family's water buffaloes out to graze. They would also help in the search for extra food. Although mushroom gathering was a favourite occupation after rainfall, catching small creatures for the evening meal was the most common task. It may seem surprising that the devoutly Buddhist Isan villagers should be so ready to take life. The harshness of the environment undoubtedly played a part. Hunting was also part of their culture that pre-existed their adoption of Buddhism by thousands of years and which they never fully abandoned. Whatever the case, the Isan villagers ate living creatures without distinction. Insects, lizards, beetles, Nothing was spared. After reading accounts of Isan village life in the early 20th century, it's easy to imagine the boy Cha in the hot season, riding a placid water buffalo out to pasture early in the morning, or in the stifling heat of midday, see him sitting in the shade of a mango tree, singing snatches of popular songs, munching lazily on a mango or taking a nap. During a rainy season downpour, as a boisterous group of young lads chase after frogs and toads, he is surely the one in the lead, roaring at the top of his voice. In the cold season, he is on another hunting expedition. With friends watching from below, he climbs up a tree, grasping a long stick, whose ends are smeared with viscous jackfruit sap and touches the backs of the cicadas, congregating on the cool, wind-blown branches. As he puts his prizes in a lidded basket to take home for dinner, he puts one or two aside for blasting the eardrum of an unwary companion. Although these scenes have a definite charm to them, Luang Po believed that they bore an unseen shadow. In later years, he said, that many of the illnesses that afflicted him throughout his life were the gummic consequences of casual cruelties he had inflicted on living creatures as a boy. Dek Wat By the 1920s, some 30 years after its inception, a state education system had still made few inroads into rural Isan. During Luang Po's childhood, Three years of primary education were available, but they were not compulsory, and few parents saw their worth. Luang Po, by the age of nine, had completed a single year. Education of the young had traditionally been one of the major functions of the village monastery. Putting aside the glaring weakness that 50% of the children, the girls, were excluded, the results were impressive. Foreign observers had often expressed surprise at the high standard of literacy amongst Thai men, at the same time, interestingly enough, as praising what they saw as the superior shrewdness and industry of the women. The boys would help out with the monastery chores, and through daily personal contact with the monks, and participating in the life of the Wat, the Thai word for a Buddhist temple or monastery, they received an education with a strong moral and spiritual foundation. It was a system that forged strong links between the monastery and the village, and it has been argued that the loss of this educational role to the state was a body blow to the rural Sangha's sense of purpose, from which it has never fully recovered. It was at the age of nine that Luang Po asked permission from his parents to move out of the family home and into the local monastery. It was a common practice for parents to entrust a son to the monks, but rare for a boy to volunteer. Many years later, Luang Po spoke of his decision in the following way. 
Well, the causes and conditions were there. As a boy, I had a fear of committing evil actions. I was always a straightforward lad. I was honest, and I didn't tell lies. When there were things to be shared out, I was considerate. I would take less than my due. That basic nature just kept maturing, until one day I said to myself, "Go to the monastery." I asked my friends if they had ever thought of doing the same thing, and none of them had. The idea just arose naturally. I'd say it was the fruit of past actions. As time went on, wholesome qualities steadily grew inside me, until one day they led me to decide and do as I did. On another occasion, in a more humorous vein, Lung Po told some lay disciples that he had become a dek wat, literally a monastery child, because he was tired of watering the family tobacco fields. He said that the more he rebelled against his chores, the more his parents had given him, afraid that he would turn out badly. As one of Lung Po's sisters remembered it, a small accident brought things to a head. Him going to live in the monastery wasn't arranged by our parents; it was his own idea. One day he was helping his brothers and sisters pounding rice, but he wasn't putting much effort into it. Well, it so happened that the pounder slipped out, and we had to drive in a wedge to keep it firm. He wouldn't help, but then, while the rest of us were doing it. He got hit by the wood we were using as a mallet. It must have hurt him because he got angry and shouted out, "That's it! I'm going to go and be a monk." Lung Po's parents took him to the local village monastery. Wat Ban Ko was situated in a large sandy enclosure, shaded by coconut palms, mango trees, and tamarinds, and consisted of a dhamma hall, a monk's dormitory, and a water ring to pose at the hall. Poor Ma and Mae Pim entrusted their son to the abbot with a predictable mixture of sadness and pride. Lung Po was now a dek wat, but this was not the beginning of a long and painful separation from his parents. By no means had Lung Po withdrawn into a secluded and cloistered realm. The boundaries between the monastery and the surrounding world were marked, not by imposing walls, but by a rather half-hearted bamboo fence. Indeed, the monastery was the central focus of the communal life of the village, rather than a refuge from it. In a sense, he had entered the world rather than left it. Monasteries in a nutshell. From early days in the history of Buddhism, there have been those who wished to live a monastic life, but felt unable to withstand the rigors. Of the peripatetic forest-dwelling regime, which had been the norm in the first phase of the Buddha's teaching career, even during the Buddha's lifetime, monasteries began to spring up on the edge of towns and villages. Many monks frowned upon this development. They felt that such monasteries were situated too close to the corrupting influences of the world. On the other hand, it could not be denied that such monasteries met a need. As Buddhism spread throughout India and beyond, the number of monks choosing to follow a more academic vocation was swelled by elderly monks and those too poor in health to live in the deep forest. At the same time, lay Buddhists were desiring to feel the presence of the Sangha more tangibly in their midst. The forest monks were revered for their piety, but seemed too remote. The villagers and town dwellers wanted monks nearby as examples and guides in their daily life, and also to play a more prominent role in traditional ceremonies and the community's social life. Over the course of time, the urban monks assumed an active and increasingly secular role that drifted from the original ideal of the bhikkhu, but was indispensable in the creation of a society that conceived itself as Buddhist. In the mid-thirteenth century, the town of Sukhothai, formerly one of the northern outposts of the Angkor Empire, became the site of the first independent Thai kingdom. By that time, 
the ancient Mon Theravada tradition dominant in Sukhothai had become compromised rather than enriched by its encounter with other traditions. To the dynamic and conquering Thais, the Buddhism of Sukhothai must have presented a rather tired and worn demeanor, a noble tradition that had lost its sense of direction. King Ram Gamhang turned instead to the lineage of forest monks introduced into southern Thailand from Sri Lanka, then the flourishing center of the Theravada world, in order to revitalize the spiritual life of his kingdom. These forest monks were proficient in both the Pali scriptures and the traditional meditation practices. They possessed the purity, integrity and freshness on which the religious life of a new self-confident Buddhist nation could be founded. The king built a monastery for them on one of the hills overlooking the city from the west, and every lunar observance day, or in Thai Wanpra, he would ride out on his white elephant, head of a large and magnificent procession, to take the precepts and listen to a sermon. The Thai Wanpra can be literally translated as Holy Day, and may be compared to the Christian Sabbath. It does not, however, fall on a particular day of the week, being determined by the lunar calendar. Through the support of the king and his court, the ideal of the forest monk was exalted. Over the centuries, however, with the gradual decline of Sukhothai and the growth and expansion of Siamese power further south in Nayutaya, it was the monasteries of the towns and villages which came to dominate. As the Sangha's role in society broadened and became more entrenched, so too did it become increasingly institutionalized. Given the immense prestige of the Sangha, it was inevitable that the king should seek to control it. A system of administration was established in which those exerting power were chosen by the king. A monastic life became a viable career as well as a vocation. Power, wealth, rank and fame were now available to the career monk, and periods of corruption in the Sangha alternated with bursts of reform. During this period, temporary spells in the monkhood came to be expected of every young man, and it was understandable that the majority of these short-term monks would prefer to stay in a more comfortable monastery close to home than in a distant and inhospitable forest where they might fall prey to spirits, wild animals and racking fevers. All such developments tended to marginalize the forest monks. From their former preeminence, the forest sangha became an insignificant force. Forest monks were mistrusted by the authorities, feared and mythologized by the villagers, and known for their purported psychic powers rather than their devotion to the Buddha's system of mind training. At the same time, the village monasteries became an intrinsic part of people's lives. The local monastery gave the village its identity, an affiliation with the unseen powers of the universe, a sense of continuity through change. Few of the images that the word monastery is likely to evoke in a Western mind would agree with the reality of a village wat in rural Thailand. It might be the abode of monks, but it was considered the property of all. The path in front of the Dhamma Hall was a public thoroughfare, and the monastery well was used by all the nearby houses. Important public meetings took place in the Dhamma Hall, which also acted as a hostel for passing travellers, and was thus the center for the reception and dissemination of news from other areas. The monastery played a central role in the social life of the village. It was the site for the important festivals that punctuated the hard struggles of the year. With daily entertainments almost non-existent, everyone looked to the lively Ngan Wat or monastery fairs for excitement and fun. Some of the fairs were of specifically Buddhist significance, for example those marking the advent and the end of the rains retreat, and the anniversary of the Buddha's birth, enlightenment and death. 
Others, like the Rocket Festival, were of a more earthy, animist character, presided over by the monks and framed by offerings of alms to them. But whatever the occasion, no Ngan would be complete without the entertainment staged in the monastery grounds. Performance by more lum minstrels, stalls of special sweetmeats and noodles, shadow plays, boxing matches and fireworks. It was a time when the usually strict constraints of Isan village society were temporarily slackened, alcohol was recklessly consumed, and in the grounds of the monastery, having fun was the order of the day. As for the monks, they were not a hereditary elite. In Thai Buddhism, temporary ordination had long been the norm and constituted a rite of passage for young men. It had thus always been easy to enter the monastic life and easy to disrobe. Leaving incurred no stigma. On disrobing, a man would be referred to as Tit, a respectful title derived from the Sanskrit Pandita, or sage. Indeed, a man who had never been a monk was considered immature, literally unripe, and a far less attractive potential husband or son-in-law than one who had spent time in the robes. Customarily, the young men in a village would become monks for the duration of the annual three-month rains retreat period, but sometimes they would remain in robes for as long as two or three years. The result was a fluid monastic community in which a floating element of temporary monastics rubbed shoulders with a core of long-term monks. One of the great merits of the system was that with every family having members who were or had been monks, the close bond between village and monastery was constantly renewed. The long-term monks would be few in number. They would almost all have been born and raised in the local village and would thus empathize deeply with the daily problems of the local people. They would take participation in village affairs seriously, sometimes as leaders in public work projects such as building bridges, or, when needed, as the impartial adviser and referee in disagreements and disputes amongst the lay community. Historically, the Wat was the centre of learning. Apart from their standing as members of the Sangha, the monks also enjoyed the extra prestige of being the most educated and knowledgeable people in the community. They would learn and transmit many skills, such as carpentry, painting, decorative arts, and tile and brick making. Some monks would be herbal doctors, and some, notwithstanding the prohibition in the monks' discipline known as the Vinaya, were astrologers. Ideally, at least, it was the monastery's religious role that was paramount. The monks were expected to be, as far as possible, the embodiment of the Buddha's teachings, and to inspire by word and deed moral and spiritual values. They were also called upon to perform traditional rituals and conduct ceremonies. They would be invited to local houses to chant blessings and sprinkle lustral water during marriages, housewarming parties, and times of sickness or ill luck. At the death of a villager, they would be invited to chant the rather abstract and philosophical Matika verses, believed to be the teachings the Buddha gave to his mother in one of the heaven realms following her death. Perhaps most significantly, the monastery was the centre for the making of merit, understood to be the lay Buddhists' most important religious activity. Merit, or in Pali, Bunya, refers to goodness as a force for present and future happiness. A wise person makes merit through acts of charity, a moral life and the cultivation of peace and wisdom. As a result, he or she leads a successful and contented life and after death is reborn in a happy realm. Offerings of food and material support for the monastery have always been the most basic and popular form of merit-making. Although individual monks might not always be especially inspiring to the laity, 
they have been considered ennobled and empowered by the yellow robe they wear, and thus able to act as fields of merit. With the accumulation of merit seen to be the most important factor affecting people's present and future prosperity and well-being, it's easy to see why monasteries commanded such a central role in village life. The abbot was usually the most powerful and respected figure in the village, combining the prestige of age, position and wisdom. Very little went on in the village without his knowing, and nothing significant without his approval. People would consult him on every subject from affairs of the heart to buying of land. Kampun Buntui's wonderful evocative novel, Child of the Northeast, gives a memorable picture of one such abbot. The young boy Kun goes to the monastery for the first time with his father to see the old abbot, Lung Po Ken, of whom he is mortally afraid. They arrive as the emaciated, black-toothed monk is speaking to a group of women. His robes, tattered and dark with age, the folded cloth that lay across one shoulder, looking like the strip of cloth tied about the trunk of the ancient Bodhi tree in the monastery yard. The women have brought their sick children to be blessed. He bent forward again and blew once more on the head of the baby with the swollen face. Then he dipped his forefinger into a small pot of something black. Five or six women held their children up, and he gently touched their tongues with his blackened finger. He cleaned his finger, leaned back against his cushion, and spoke again in his deep, rumbling voice. You people come to me for everything, for mumps. He shook his head slowly. Everybody who wants to become a monk comes to me, that I can understand. But also, everybody whose baby is sick, everybody who's building a new house, everybody who wants to get married, everyone who wants to name a child or who has the red-eye disease, they all come to me. You people should think, if I die, then who's going to look after all these things? This year, I'll be 85 years old. He was silent again for a moment, looking at the babies, and then laughed quietly to himself. Oh well, oh well. Luang Po spent four years as a Dek Wat. During that time, he learned to read and write, helped with the sweeping and cleaning of the monastery, served the monks, and gradually absorbed at least the ambiance and flavour of the basic Buddhist teachings. His duties were not onerous, and there was plenty of time for play with his fellow Dek Wat. Of these there was a constant supply, as it was customary for weary parents to send their unmanageable sons to the monastery to be cured of their wildness. Orphans, if there was no relation to take them, could always find a refuge with the monks. Apart from accepting boys for spiritual reasons, the monastery was also the local social welfare center. Novice Bullfrog In the monk's discipline, it is laid down that an aspirant must be 20 years of age before he can become a monk, but that a boy old enough to scare crows can become a novice. Luang Po took the going forth vows in March 1931. He was 13 and could probably have shooed off a raiding hawk. As a novice, Luang Po's sturdy frame and bulging belly, together with his resonant voice, earned him the nickname of Ung, or Bullfrog. Life carried on in almost the same relaxed fashion as it had when he was a simple temple boy, although wearing the robe conferred a higher status and increased expectations, at least in front of the laity a restrained demeanour was expected. This was not always so easy. One of his fellow novices recalled, Every now and again, there'd be an invitation to chant in somebody's house, and he would break into giggles in the middle of the chanting. As soon as he started, that was it. We couldn't help ourselves. We had to join in. Sometimes, he'd even start laughing during the meal. 
he was always finding something funny. Luang Po would spend time every day walking up and down in the shade, memorizing the various Pali chants, the daily service, meal blessings, auspicious verses chanted at housewarming parties and marriages, funeral chants, and Dhamma reflections. A tu wang ji witang, du wang maranang, a wasang maya marita pang. Life is uncertain, death is certain. I too will die. He also completed the first of the three levels of the Naptam Dhamma exams. It included sections on the Buddha's life and teachings, the code of discipline and the history of Buddhism, and provided a sound foundation of the core teachings. At other times, gardening and building projects served to work off teenage steam. Back to the world. During his novice years, Luang Po's teacher and mentor was a monk called Ajahn Lang. In accordance with the reciprocal relationship laid down in the Vinaya texts, Ajahn Lang oversaw Luang Po's studies and Luang Po, in return, acted as his personal attendant. Every now and then in the evenings, Ajahn Lang would kindly accompany Luang Po on visits to his family. It would have been forbidden for a novice to go alone. Indeed, he seemed to enjoy these excursions even more than Luang Po, exuding a confidence and charm amongst Luang Po's family that the young novice may well have found a little eccentric. At Ajahn Lang's instigation, the visits became steadily more frequent and protracted. Sometimes it would be late at night before the two of them walked back to the monastery, accompanied by the barks of the village dogs their footsteps disturbed. One day, Ajahn Lung confided in Luang Po that he had decided to disrobe, and suggested that his protégé might do likewise. A confused Luang Po agreed. He had been living in the Wat for seven years, and at the dangerous and wobbly age of sixteen, a small push was enough. Some days after the joint disrobing, Luang Po's parents were visited by elder relatives of ex Ajahn Lang to discuss a marriage proposal. The ardent admirer of Luang Po's sister, Sa, assured of her affections, was free at last to declare his love. Luang Po went to work in the family fields. Inevitably, the novelty of mud and sweat soon wore off and although he applied himself to the regular round of the rice farmer with a gusto that earned praise from his family, it seems that he bore quietly within himself a sense of something lost and unfulfilled. It was not an overpowering emotion. He was a buoyant, vigorous young man, but it was a constant, unobtrusive shadow which he could only try to ignore. For the moment, Luang Po was content to divert himself in the usual ways. Together with a small group of friends, he would walk to monastery fairs in neighbouring villages, where they could all enjoy normal young men's pleasures, including flirting with the local girls. By this time, Luang Po's remarkable powers of endurance were already beginning to manifest themselves, albeit in rather mundane matters. He and his friends might walk as much as 15 kilometers to a monastery fair and then, late at night, walk all the way back. Some of the young men in their group, a little the worse for drink, might want to stop and sleep under a tree somewhere on the way. But Luang Po, his old companions remembered long afterwards, would always insist on walking the whole way home. He was, however, not without his weaknesses. Confident and self-assured as he seemed, Luang Po had a deep fear of ghosts. He could work all day and then walk all night if he chose to, but not through a spirit-thick forest alone. Luang Po's home was separated from his best friend Putz by such a stretch of haunted forest. If they arrived back late at night, Luang Po would sleep at his friend's house rather than go on alone. Young Love And then Luang Po fell in love with Put's stepsister Jai.
he started spending more and more of his time in Put's house, courting her. The custom of the day decreed that young couples should not be alone together, and touching of any kind was taboo. The young man was to meet with his girl at her family home, upstairs on the porch in the evening, where she would be sitting demurely. Jai's parents seemed content enough with the prospective match. Lung Po was a friend of the family, good-natured, hard-working and honest, and, perhaps more importantly, his family were wealthy enough to offer a good bride price. One evening, the young couple hatched a plan. They would marry as soon as Luang Po had completed his national service and spent a rains retreat as a monk to make merit for his parents in the time-honoured way. At the time, Luang Po was 18 years old and Jai 17. It would be another four years before they could even expect to hold hands. As the rainy season approached, every household was busy preparing ploughs, rakes, hoes, yokes, fish traps and machetes for the upcoming work in the paddy fields. Luang Po had just taken out a load of tools to the family's small hut, raised on stilts in the middle of their fields. You may imagine the scene. An overcast, oppressively humid sky, and underneath it, a stocky young man, with an unusually wide mouth, bare-chested, his komar cloth around his loins bumping up and down on the uncomfortable wooden seat of an ox cart as it jolts along a rutted lane between the vibrant green of the rice fields. He is about to receive devastating news. Luang Po related the story himself many years later. When I was 18, I liked a girl. She liked me too, and as these things go, I eventually fell in love. I wanted to marry her, I daydreamed about having her by my side, helping me out in the fields, making a living together. Then, one day on my way home from work, I met my best friend Put on the road. He said, Cha, I'm taking the lady. When I heard those words, I went completely numb. I was in a state of shock for hours afterwards. I remembered the prediction of an astrologer that I would have no wife but many children. At that time, I wondered how it could be possible. Simply, and with the unquestioned prerogative that parents of his age and culture possessed, Put's father and stepmother had decided that the two stepchildren should marry. There was no more to be said. The reasons were pragmatic, financial. If Put married Jai, the family would be saved a bride price they could ill afford. They had just acquired land some distance from the village that should not be left fallow. The young couple could move out there and farm it together. Luang Po, desolate, had no choice but to reconcile himself to the situation. It made no sense to be angry with Put. His friend had not plotted behind his back and was painfully embarrassed by the whole affair. But this disappointment was a profound one, a sharp and hurtful lesson in the uncertainties that bedevil human affairs. Luang Po did not give up on his friendship with Put, and in fact, it was to last for the rest of his life. But with Jai, he had to be more circumspect. He could not force his feelings for her to disappear by an act of will. As a young monk, if he saw Jai in the monastery, he would do his utmost to avoid an encounter that might stir up difficult emotions. Luang Po admitted that for the first seven years of his monkhood, he found it impossible to completely let go of his thoughts for this young woman. At this early stage of his monastic life, Luang Po, like a great many young monks through the ages, must have been assailed by fantasies featuring tantalizing scenarios and miraculous happy endings that, when coolly considered, he did not truly desire. 
It was only when he finally left his familiar surroundings and, through meditation practice, gained a method of stilling his thoughts and seeing them in perspective that the fantasies faded. In later years, as Abba to Watbapong, describing to the monks the drawbacks of sensual desire, he would often talk of the debt of gratitude he owed to Put. If he hadn't married Mer Jai, then I probably wouldn't be here today. Perhaps this is so, but at the same time, it seems safe to assume that if he had not met this particular obstacle to a conventional married life, another would surely have emerged. In a recorded talk decades later, Luang Po revealed, I was fed up. I didn't want to live with my parents. The more I thought about it, the more fed up I became. I just wanted to go off by myself the whole time, although where to, I had no idea. I felt like that for a number of years. I was fed up, but not with anything in particular. I just wanted to go somewhere and be alone. These were the feelings I had before I became a monk. I wasn't always fully conscious of them, but they were there all the same, all of the time. Luang Po only ever mentioned two other incidents occurring in his relations with the opposite sex. In the first, an ex-monk with whom Luang Po had been friendly during his years as a novice died at an early age, and Luang Po assisted the bereaved family throughout the days of the funeral proceedings. On the night of the cremation, after the last guests had returned to their homes, Luang Po, as a close family friend, felt concerned that the widow and her children would feel lonely and desolate if left alone. He offered to stay on for a couple of nights to keep them company in their grief. On the second night, Luang Po became aware that the lady of the house had come out of the bedroom and had laid down beside him. She took his hand and started to guide it over her body. Luang Po pretended to be asleep. Finding no response, the lady got up and slipped quietly back into her room. In later years, Luang Po was to admit that sexual desire was the one defilement which he had great difficulty in overcoming. But here, in a situation that bore all the elements of an adolescent fantasy and unbound by vows of celibacy, he was remarkably restrained. The reason may have been fear or lack of physical attraction. In view of his later struggles, however, it is more likely that Luang Po's sense of propriety and his respect for a dead friend overcame desire. It was not unusual for young Thai men of Luang Po's generation to end an evening out with a visit to a brothel. It was quite natural then that his second and final close encounter with a woman occurred in one such establishment, in the back streets of the local town of Warin. The incident occurred shortly before he became a monk, when Luang Po's old friends managed to persuade him that before renouncing the pleasures of the flesh, he should at least first sample their delights. In the end, it was not to be. Once alone in a room, with the young woman he had chosen to help him lose his virginity, Luang Po could not help but notice, through the thick powder on her face, the ravages of acne. An uncontrollable disgust arose within him. He got up abruptly, and the next thing he knew, he was standing at a street-side food stall with a bowl of noodles in his hand. If it was a debacle, then it was one which most aptly and rather comically foreshadowed the struggles of the next few years. As a young village monk, the only desire that could match Luang Po's sexual lust was a craving for Chinese noodles, a craving so strong that it led him to sneak out of the wat to his favourite vendor on more than one occasion. Ordination By now it may be apparent 
that there is a dearth of verifiable biographical information about Luang Por's youth. The full extent of what is known about his early life has been gleaned from a small number of reminiscences from old friends and family members, private asides recollected by his close disciple Ajahn Jan, and a few passages taken from Dhamma talks. The rest, especially indications of the evolution of his inner life, will always remain opaque. What is known is that by the time Luang Por discovered that he would not be called up for national service and so was free to take ordination, his views about monkhood had changed. He no longer considered it simply in terms of making merit for his parents, as an expression of the gratitude he felt towards them. While that was certainly an admirable aim, he now saw that life as a monk might be able to resolve the lack of peace and meaning in his life. The world was a hollow, tedious place, full of vicissitudes. Perhaps the monastic life could lead him to something better. He decided to become a monk for an indefinite period. His mother and father were pleased. They had enough children to help them with the farm work, and it was auspicious to have a son in robes. The ordination ceremony in Pali Upasampada took place on the 26th of April 1939 at Wat Gor Nai, the local ordination monastery, on a hot, shimmering afternoon. Prakru Intarasara Kun was Luang Por's preceptor and conferred on him the monk's name of Suppatto, meaning well-developed. Luang Por spent the first two years of his life as a monk at Wat Ban Go, the monastery where he had been a novice, studying the teachings and preparing to retake the first-level Naktam exams, which, although Luang Por had passed as a novice, it was customary to retake once ordained as a monk. When I first became a monk, I didn't train myself, but I had faith. Maybe I was born with it, I don't know. At the end of the rains retreat, the monks and novices who joined the Sangha at the same time as me all disrobed. I thought, what's wrong with them? But I didn't dare to say anything, because I still didn't trust my feelings. My friends were excited at leaving, but to me they seemed foolish. I considered how difficult it was to enter the Sangha, and how easy to disrobe. I thought how lacking in merit they must be to look on the worldly path as more beneficial than that of Dhamma. That's how I looked at it, but I said nothing. I kept my thoughts to myself. I'd watch my fellow monks and novices come and go. Sometimes, before they disrobe, they try on their lay clothes and parade up and down. I thought they were completely insane, but they thought they looked good, that their clothes were smart. And they talked about the things they were going to do after they disrobed. I didn't dare to tell them that they'd got it all wrong, because I didn't know how durable my own faith was. After my friends disrobed, I became resigned. You're on your own now, I said to myself. I pulled out my copy of the Batimoka and started to memorize it. It was easier than before with nobody teasing me or fooling around. I was able to concentrate on it fully. I didn't say anything, but I made a resolution that from that day onwards, until the end of my life, whether it be at the age of 70 or 80 or whenever, I would try to practice with a constant appreciation, to not allow my efforts to slacken or my faith to weaken, to be consistent. That's an extreme thing to do and I didn't dare to tell anyone else. People came and went and I said nothing. I merely watched impassively, but in my mind I was thinking they don't see clearly. However, Luang Po had his own problems in those days. Food became an obsession. Practicing Dhamma is no smooth ride. You suffer. The first and second years are especially hard. 
the young monks and the small novices really go through it. I myself suffered a lot. If you've got a problem with food, it's rough. I became a monk when I was twenty. That's the age when, who can deny it, you really enjoy food and sleep. Sometimes I just sit there quietly dreaming about things I'd like to eat. Pounded tiny bananas, green papaya salad, all kinds of things. The saliva would be flowing like a river in my mouth. After completing his examination, Lung Po decided to leave in search of a more academic atmosphere than his home monastery could provide. In 1941, he resided in Wat Suan Sawan, about 50 kilometers to the east of Bangkok, and continued his studies at nearby Wat Po Tak. These were the war years. Thailand, officially at least, was an ally of Japan and Ubon had recently been bombed by the French. Food and everyday necessities were in short supply, and the requisites at Wat Port Dak, where the Sangha was large, were barely adequate. Luang Por could endure the conditions, but he found the standard of teaching there disappointing, and after a single range retreat, he set off with a companion to a neighbouring district in order to continue his studies at Wat Ban Nong Lak. He had heard many monks praise the teaching abilities of the abbot of this monastery and found it to be deserved. However, when his friend found the summer heat and scanty food at the monastery too taxing, Luang Por agreed to move with him to another monastery in a nearby town. There, he studied for the second level of the Naktam exams and embarked on the somewhat rather dry study of Pali grammar. After passing the exam in 1943, Luang Po returned to Wat Ban Nong Lak. It was a year in which he concentrated all his considerable energies on studying for the third and final Nak Tam exam and continuing with his Pali grammar. For the first time, Luang Po had found a gifted teacher who inspired him with confidence and respect, and his studies progressed smoothly. Towards the end of that year, Luang Po received dismaying news. His father had fallen seriously ill. Luang Po's exams were to take place shortly, and if he went home now, a whole year's work would be wasted. Should he chance it and take his exams before going home? It was no choice at all. He had only one father, and exams could wait another year. He rushed home as soon as he could, to find his father's condition in steady decline. Luang Po's father, Po Ma, was proud to have a son in the robes, and whenever Luang Po visited home, would always encourage him in his efforts and make a request. Please don't disrobe, venerable sir. I invite you to remain a monk indefinitely. This is a deliberately literal translation. It's hard to convey in the English language the tenor of a conversation between a Thai monk and his parents. Filial piety is greatly emphasized in Thai culture, and the relationship between parents and children is generally warm and close. Yet, when the son becomes a monk, their way of relating to each other instantly and radically changes. The parents are now lay people, they sit on a lower seat, at a respectful distance. They use monastic honorifics when referring to their son and humble personal pronouns when referring to themselves. To an observer from another culture, this formality might at first seem odd or perhaps unnatural. But for the family itself, it is simply the accepted convention. The stilted speech forms help everyone to remember that while the son's identity as a monk has not erased his identity as a member of his family, it has transformed it. Now, as he lay weak and shrunken on his deathbed, poor Ma made the request one last time. You've made the right choice. Don't change it. Lay life is full of so many kinds of suffering and difficulties. 
there's no real peace or contentment in it. Remain as a monk. On previous occasions, Luang Po had always kept silent, his head slightly bowed, showing respect but an unwillingness to make such a commitment. This time, however, he replied, No, I won't disrobe. Why would I do that? His father's face relaxed into a warm, contented smile, and he drifted into sleep. When poor Ma discovered that Luang Po's exams would take place shortly, he urged him to return to his what, but this request was refused. Instead, Luang Po helped to nurse his father for the thirteen more days and nights that he lingered on. It was December, when the days have a drained, subdued tone and a cold wind blows down through Isan from China, when first thing in the morning, everyone lights fires outside their houses to warm themselves, and Jews harp kites, anchored high in the air, utter their melancholy cry throughout the night. Dui, 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 dui. One night, at the end of the year, poor Ma's life came to its end. A Solemn Resolve In the period following his father's death, Luang Po's monastic life began to follow a new direction. The change was almost certainly precipitated by his loss. Having for some years steeped himself in Buddhist texts, analysing the human condition in general terms, he had come face to face with mortality on its most personal level. The human body is a mere conglomeration of the elements of solidity, fluidity, heat and vibration. The inevitability of old age, sickness, death and of the separation from all we love, prominent features of passages learnt by rote in the Wat, must have acquired much deeper meaning for him. Seeing his father in pain before death, helping place his lifeless body in the coffin, watching it burn on the funeral pyre, gathering the bones remaining in the cremation ashes, all would have made a profound impression on the young monk. Many years later, Luang Po recalled that on returning to Wat Ban Nonglak after his father's funeral, he made a solemn resolve. I dedicate my body and mind, my whole life, to the practice of the Lord Buddha's teachings in their entirety. I will realize the truth in this lifetime. I will let go of everything and follow the teachings. No matter how much suffering and difficulty I have to endure, I will persevere. Otherwise, there will be no end to my doubts. I will make this life as even and continuous as a single day and night. I will abandon attachments to mind and body and follow the Buddha's teachings until I know their truth for myself. As a result, Luang Po started practicing meditation more seriously, but not without difficulties. The first year of meditation, I got nothing from it. My mind just teemed with thoughts about things I wanted to eat. It was really hopeless. Sometimes, during a meditation session, it would be as if I was actually eating a banana. I could feel it in my mouth. The defilements have been in the mind for many lifetimes. When you come to discipline it, there's bound to be a struggle. It was during this year of 1944 that Luang Po's mother, Mae Pim, had a vivid dream in which two of her teeth fell out. She later remembered that in her dream, her immediate dismay at this loss was cut short by a voice saying, Never mind. Don't worry about those teeth. They will be replaced by teeth of gold. She woke up, putting a hand instinctively to her mouth. Some days later, at the foot of the steps leading up to her house, she discovered a sprouting tree growing at an uncanny speed. It was a Bodhi tree, the same species as that under which the Buddha realized awakening. When she approached the abbot of the monastery for advice, he told her that it was an auspicious omen. 
the most appropriate thing to do would be to replant the tree in the monastery. He said that the magical appearance of a Bodhi tree in front of Mayor Pim's house meant that a great being would appear in her family. At the same time as making his first fledgling attempts at meditation, Luang Po carried on his study of Pali in the time-honored way, translating Dhammapada commentary stories into Thai. He could not help but notice the disparity between his own life and those of the monks in the Buddha's time. They wandered in the jungles, solitary, ardent and resolute, whereas he was poring over books in a monastery schoolroom. Having made a resolution to dedicate his life to the monastic order, the question before him was to decide in exactly which way he should live that life. He decided that the answer was to make a fresh start, to abandon his studies, and to devote himself wholeheartedly to the path of practice. In other words, to become a forest monk. The next step was to look for guidance. At that time, Isan was still both thickly forested and thinly populated. There were few roads and little traffic. The only way that one was likely to hear of a good teacher was by word of mouth, perhaps from a passing Tudong monk a wandering monk keeping various optional ascetic practices. The forest masters were few and far between and cherished their anonymity. Despite having been a member of the Sangha for seven years, Luang Po's decision to take up meditation, to become what was called a practice monk, was not as straightforward as might be imagined. He opted to return to Wat Banko while he decided on his next move. As it happened, Wat Ba San Samran, a forest monastery established by disciples of Lung Pu Man, Lung Po's eventual teacher, lay just a few kilometers from Banko, on the edge of the town of Warin. But as it was a monastery of a different monastic lineage, he did not at that time consider it an option. After a visit to a forest monastery in Det Udom district in the hot season had ended in disappointment, Luang Po's nascent plans were overtaken by the rains. He spent the retreat at Wat Banko, helping to teach the first level Nak Tam course to the young monks and novices. His students showed little enthusiasm for their studies. They attended the classes in a merely perfunctory way, lazy and disrespectful. It was the final confirmation of the unsatisfactoriness of the life he had led for seven years. In December, Luang Po took the third and final level of the Naktam course and prepared for a new going forth. Just as there is very little material on which to base the story of Luang Po's early life, there is also a frustrating lack of available information about the following most formative years of his monastic life. The whole chronology of events presented here dating from Luang Po's departure from Ubon at the beginning of 1947 until his establishment of Wat Ba Pong in mid-1954 is necessarily a tentative one, being largely the result of detective work and inference. One date, however, can be asserted with real confidence and thus used as an anchor for all the others. Luang Po once mentioned that the year he spent the rains retreat with his teacher Lung Bu Ginnery was the one in which the lunar calendar is adjusted to synchronize with the solar calendar by adding an extra month. As this event occurs only once every three years, it can only be 1948.